All right, back again. I got a great episode today on Hootie Social Club. Very special guest today. Um, positive messages are going out today. Uh, when I first heard this young man's uh, interview, I had no idea that he was a black belt in jiu-jitsu, uh, a grappler, uh, trains with boxes, uh, very good with his hands. Uh, he was a street guy a long time in uh, the Colombo family, associate of other crime families, uh, hooked up with the LA family. I mean, his resume goes on and on and on, uh, but we're going to focus on the positive today. So without further ado, the one and only Kenji Gallo, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad that I finally got to lock you down. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, and like I said, uh, I was finding Kenny Gallo everywhere, and I couldn't find Kenji, you know? And I didn't know about yeah. the jiu-jitsu. So I seen all this jiu-jitsu stuff, and I'm like, and I know somebody in the jiu-jitsu world, but they have, these guys have this secret code, you know? It's like a fraternity. So I didn't want to ask him and, you know, have put on the spot that he wouldn't be able to tell me if that was your name and who you were. But I, get, I, I shot your message and you got back to me like a gentleman and I appreciate that. And uh, even if it was a yes or no, you were a total gentleman with me. And um, from what I heard about you in the street, see, I, we're not going to do a and a We're going to yeah. just have a conversation. I'm not like the rest of these podcasts yeah. that want to know uh, all the bad things that you did. I want to right. know, I want every, my supporters to know that you were a guy in the streets. You were a capable guy. You were a street guy. You were a stand-up guy. And you were able to turn that around when you decided to. Correct. Make your life for the better. That's what this message is about. So what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to start when you were young. Like, what, where did you yeah. grow up? And why did you want, where did you want to go in life before ending up here as a black belt? Listen, I grew up in Orange County, California. I was born in Los Angeles, California. Um, I went to high school in Irvine and Newport Beach. So uh, I was upper, you know, upper middle class. I wanted to be a gangster. I know, it's weird. I came from that area. And um, obviously, you could tell I'm, I'm part Japanese. You know, it's, it's not like the normal, it's not the normal route. But uh, my dad got me a job at a restaurant. Uh, the restaurant where I got a job at, I was a busboy kitchen help. And that was the main, it was like, that's where all the criminals hung out, the major criminals in, in Southern California. And I got to know them all. The, the main people from the Medellin cartel, which is the big cocaine cartel back then, were there at that restaurant. They used to come in all the time, including uh, Griselda Trujillo Blanco. Not, we used to call her Mama Coca. They call her the Black Widow now, but we called her Mama Coca. And she was there, her sons were there. Um, other people like uh, Gacha Rodriguez's cousin from the Medellin cartel, I mean, big, big dopers, huge guys. And uh, once I met those guys, that's what I wanted to be. I, I zeroed in at 13, this is, this is what I wanna do. Um, I met a guy there, uh, Mark from the LA family that, uh, that he ran their gambling, a lot of their gambling. He taught me how to, uh, you know, do bookmaking, take action. I used to sell football cards for him. And that was it. I was just enamored with that life. And I just, I was there for the cocaine boom. So I could get kilos for cheap and I could flip them for big money. And I used to take them between California and Hawaii. And I just kept growing, growing. My crew got bigger. And, uh, and then, you know, of course I met guys from the LA family. So I started to, cause you make money. They, they're interested in, you know, they, they don't want to, they don't care about your good, about you being okay or all right. They, they want you to, to make money. And I was a, I was a good money maker, and uh, it just kept growing. And I got into, after that, I got into pornography. And of course you run into more guys from, you know, I ran into guys from the Columbos, from the Lucchese, from the Gambinos that way. Um, and uh, I used to go to, go to go in the summer and go to Jersey Shore. So, you know, I met a lot of people there. And then uh, you just keep going up. I, I, I got to be with the LA family. I was with a, the street boss, a capo named uh, Jimmy Tachi. Dominic Vincent Gachi, well-respected guy with, from New York, from Buffalo, New York, but was locked up in Attica for like 10 years. So he knew everybody and all the families down there. And uh, I used to drive him around and uh, got to know everybody in different, you know, different, different crews, different families that way. And uh, finally, I decided to go to New York and I well, talked to someone I there. Wanna, I want to touch on the stuff now. Um, yeah. 
there was a lot of movies about Blanco Giselle. Uh, yeah. She, she, she stood up against the government. She took yeah. 10 years. I don't know how she only got 10 years for all the murdering that she was doing throughout L.A. Uh, eventually, both her sons were killed. And then when yeah. she came home, uh, they wind up killing her in her home country. Uh, yeah. You were dealing with the Medellin cartel. Now, yeah. the Medellin cartel, uh, which they don't know, was the cartel that Pablo Escobar was part of before they killed him. And you're in the right age group where Pablo yeah. was killed in the 90s, and you remember that. Just so that people don't yeah. get to but people really know that you aren't just dealing with, listen, we can say what we want about Cosa Nostra. You make a mistake, you give an envelope, that's the end of it. The people that you're talking about, you make a mistake, they, they mail your head to your family. Bottom line. Yeah. And this is what you were involved in. And yeah, um, that's I mean, his people. And yeah, one of my one of my best friends at a Colombian that he got he ended up getting 17 years. He's out now. He's a he's a pastor, actually. But he worked for Pablo Escobar and he was one of my best friends. He got caught delivering 1000 kilos in 1989 to the FBI. And he only got 17 so, years, huh? God bless him. Well, he, he, he got more, but he won, an, he won an appeal. He got out after 17, oh, right. which, is a, which is a long time, you know? But he, yeah. he changed his life. He's no longer like that, you know? So it's a different, different guy. That's, that's what we're all about, that uh, the second chances that they're giving us. Because you know how yep. the, the state doesn't feel the same way as the government. The government right. feels that we should never get second chances because guys like us are just going to constantly go back. And guys like me, guys like you guys that we're speaking to, we're all going to try to prove them wrong the best way we can. So with that, now you met an L.A. boss. Now, I'm familiar with that boss because he was actually, I think, a lot of those guys in L.A. weren't straightened out, meaning they no, no ceremonies like, the, like out west. But the guy that you're actually talking about was around Stefano. Am I not correct? Yeah. Buffalo? Yeah. Right. Yeah, but he, he, he was straightened out. They were all, I, I know they had a ceremony. I know where they had it. And I know where they had the second ceremony because Pete Milano was the actual boss and his dad and his uncle were the boss of Cleveland at one point and on the commission. Right. So yeah, those guys all yeah. get straightened out. Yeah, that's they all I, got straightened out. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I just wanted to point out that because he comes from Stefano is a, was a big, was the boss. Yeah. Boss. In Buffalo. And he came yeah. up to him. And then he went yeah. out to L.A. and became a boss in his own right. And you were yeah. his driver. That's how you got yeah. started. Yeah, good for, and good friend. Just a, really, a good guy to me. Like, really, he's, he's, he's actually one of the people that I – he's an old school Costa Nostra. Like, he couldn't cuss in front of women. Um, you know what I mean? He didn't want to have anything to do with drugs. He was completely – he's not like the ones that you see today. It's completely different. And, and they're a dying breed. They're almost all of them are gone. All the guys that were, you know, in Brooklyn are gone. You know, it's not right. the same anymore. Yeah. You know – when I tell people that about cursing in front of women, they look at me like I'm yeah. crazy. I try to no. teach guys that I talk to today that want to come around and be around, but legitimately, you know, like I, I hang out, we have a social club. Everything's on the up and up. It's in little Italy. It's, you know, and I, and I try to show them the ways, even though we're doing everything legit to try not to curse at all. Right. Because years ago, you couldn't curse in front of women. I get, I would get yep. a back slap. If we were yep. on a corner, how guys, you know, they, they, they check old girls now in the city where most of these tapinadas, they get, tur they get turned on by it. They like the men. Oh, yeah. Years ago, I know standing on the corner, if I would curse and a woman was walking by, I would have got a crack in the mouth. And that's how the old yep. school guys were. And that's how yeah. I learned. It's funny that you say that. This is, and you know, this is where I'm coming to because now we're going to get to New York. Um, yeah. But you study and you're a black belt mm -hmm. and jiu-jitsu and yeah. grappling and UFC, MMA, mixed martial arts as well, you know, you guys have a code, and your code is lying is a weakness, cowards are liars. So I know that in this sit down, in this conversation, that everything that you're going to tell me is going to be 100% honest because there's no, if you're not going to lie in the life that you're living out there, I'm nobody to you. You're definitely not going to lie to me. But I know because being around it, and I have a very good friend in it, you guys are all about honesty, loyalty, and being upfront with things. And I like to let my supporters know that that this interview, if not like any other, I got a guy here that's you're gonna get a hundred percent the truth out of everything that he's saying. And one of the things like he just said, a lot of people don't know is that you don't curse in front of women. 
Yeah, and also see, like even with with the martial arts that I do, like jujitsu or or grappling or even in boxing or kickboxing, you can't fake it. It's not like you're. It's not like some of the other martial arts where you wear a belt around and a gi. It's like, dude, a guy comes in, they want to roll with you. That's it. I'm gonna choke him out. I'm gonna get him. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tap him out, or he's gonna get me. There's no faking it. That's it. And if he's a hundred pounds bigger than me, then I better be good. <laughs> That's it. You better be that. Now, yeah. So now. So, you're with the LA family now, yep. which this is where I made my mistake in life. I was doing well with drugs. I was dealing with the uh, Mexicans and the Dominicans. I had nothing to do friends with a lot of guys in Cosa Nostra, but nothing to do with them yet. And mm -hmm. I always say that was my downfall. So now how do you go from LA to ended up with the Colum which one of the worst families out yeah. of life <laughs> with the Columbus, well, New York. Because I, I, I met a, a, some of the Columbos that are related to him from in, in the porn business in, in when I was in the porn business. And then I used to take porn girls to like to, to do shows, you know, when they feature dance at nightclubs. Right. And I go to I go to New York clubs and whenever I did, I touch base with those guys. So I got friendly with them. We'd hang out. Um, I, I knew some Columbos that lived in Florida. I got friendly with them. Um, one of them was uh, really, really close, had been in, in Sonny Francis' uh, crew and had been uh, like another lady. It was, was his girlfriend for like 30 years. And so I, I was real close to a lot of Columbos that way. And so when I went to L.A., I mean, when I went to, to Brooklyn, one of them asked me, hey, man, you should move here. And I'm like, oh, I probably can't. And he's like, no, no, we, we can, I can work it out. And uh, that was Eddie Garofolo. He, he told me, you should move here. And I said, ah, I don't know. But then I thought about it and I'm like, well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well. Why play, why play in the Angels when I can go to the Yankees? You know what I mean? Like I can move up. So you're and talking so, about tall guy, Eddie Garofolo, the son? Yeah. The yeah. Only company? Yeah. Oh, what? Uh, I didn't, I didn't know Eddie was involved with the, Wow. Eddie was a, I know Eddie on a, on a, on a regular level or working level. He lived out in uh, Jersey. Very nice. Yes, guy. In, in, in Cherry Hill, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Yeah, very, very. I thought he was a great guy. Terrible gambler, but a great guy. Yeah, Der big R trucking. Yeah, yeah, he was oh. a great guy. Yeah. Terrible, a monster of a guy too. Could fight. Yeah, guy. I seen him so, a couple times. So Ed, Eddie, Eddie talked because Teddy was in prison. He talked to Teddy, and then Teddy worked it out. And Jimmy knew Teddy or uh, knew Carmen from. Uh, they're in prison together, so. They, I just moved and I moved to, I started, I moved to Bay Ridge and uh, then I started hanging out with all those guys there. That's it. Started, and that was with Teddy, but, but Teddy was locked up. Okay. You got to remember Teddy, Teddy had gotten 25 years to life for drugs, but then the Rockefeller laws changed and he got out after 17, 18 years. Which a lot of people don't well, know that he was doing that state time. He wasn't doing federal time. Yeah. That's right. I knew that because he, he had won all types of championships. He was a quarterback. Yeah. I hear all types of stories about him upstate in uh, the prison systems that he had all types of football teams. And a lot of people don't know that, that, yeah, he got 25 years and then the, Rock, the Rockefeller law changed and he got it overturned. Yeah. So uh, that's, and then I met Teddy that way. Basically, I, I, I provided him with the porn star when he got out of prison and gave him a cell phone and a pair of sweats and a and uh, Cartier watch and a pair of new white sneakers. And a thousand dollars. What? That was the first time you met him. Yeah. Well, I had talked to him on the phone and I had sent him some pictures of some girls and stuff. Like, you know, was, they asked me to do something for him and I did. And uh, that was it. I knew his brother. I knew Danny, you right. know. Yeah. So I should, I see Danny. Father? The one that got what? locked no. up in the East? No, no, I, no. He was. He was already locked up. Uh, oh, I knew his brother. I knew Carmen and I knew um, Sean, the other one. Okay. And, uh, and Danny and who else was there? And I met, I, I met some of the other, other Persicos too, like Little Alley Boy. They call him Little Alley Boy. Yeah, and some other guys like that. Yeah, so I knew all them before Teddy. And then I was hanging out with Craig Marino and John Bonanza. Oh, okay. And then, um, and yeah. Craig, so you were, you were with all the heavy hitters. Yeah. You know, heavy and that and the Colombo family. Yeah. So they that, don't you get know, that in the streets. Yeah. So that that's that's the guys that I was running around with almost on a daily basis in when I was living in Brooklyn. Those those guys.
So, but there wasn't so. no drugs involved in that. That was just the pornography yeah. and the bookmaking and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, bookmaking, Shylocking. That's all I was doing then. You know, I I, I quit drugs after the '90s. And it, it got uh, the price went down, and that many cartels got broken up. They probably got killed. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. The price the price was down. I used to get it for like. I don't know, 12, 14,000 a kilo, sell for 27,000. You know, we could sell it in Hawaii for 40,000, 30,000. Wow. But then, but by the, at the end, it was, I was getting, I was paying like 10,500 selling for 11,500. Like, what's the point? I mean, wow. seriously. And you, and, and you started getting real time. So we're going to get real time for $1,000. You know what I mean? It yeah, doesn't it, even pay. Uh, yeah. It didn't even pay right. anymore. So now you come to New York and you just, you, you got right in with the heavy hitters. That was you and right yep. to the top. It was no playing yep. game. Yeah. But then what happened is in between that, the FBI had called me. They, actually, they didn't call me. They went to a girl's grandmother that I knew the girl and her grandmother. And they went to her house outside of Las Vegas and they left a card with her, the grandmother, not with the girl, with the grandmother. And she, I was in Rhode Island at that time. And she called me and, um, the, the, the grandmother called me and said, hey, the FBI was just by here looking for me. I go, at your house? Why would they do that? They, they know I, have a, I had a porn shop. I had like businesses. You know what I mean? They knew where to find me. Not like I'm hiding. And then she gave me the name of the guy in the card. And I'm like, okay. So I called him. Well, I, I called the main number of the FBI. And I asked for him to, to make sure he's an FBI agent. You know what I mean? To see what he was. And then he's like, oh, hey, we just want to talk to you. And I'm like, well, I'm gone. I'm going to go. I'm going to be gone for like the next three weeks, you know? And he's like, well, you know, just, when you get back in town, make sure you give me a call and we're going to meet up with you. So I'm like, am I getting arrested? Just, <laughs> just tell me. Cause I'll just call my lawyer. You know what I mean? Like I can deal with this. So I figured I'm getting arrested again. And, um, I went to, uh, I did my stuff in Providence and I left from Providence and then I flew back to California and I was like, okay, I'm going, I'm getting locked up again. So I went down there. I worked two pairs of sweats, a hoodie, a sweatshirt, and everything that, some slip-on shoes. And I brought 20 bucks, took off all my jewelry, didn't bring a cell phone. And because, you know, I figured I'm getting locked up right then. You know, I mean, I mean that's how you can tell. Anybody that's been to jail before does exactly what you do when they get called in. Yeah, you don't, you don't want shoelaces. You, don't, you gotta be warm because you know you're gonna be going through processing. Two pairs, and so, pairs, two pairs of socks, yeah. two pairs of sweats. Yeah. Just enough so, not to bother you. And so I get there and there's two FBI agents waiting outside this deli for me. And they, uh, they, they asked me if I had a weapon or something. I'm like, no, nah, I don't have anything. They're like, hey, can we check? Go ahead. They did it. And then they go, okay, look, we're going to go inside. We have a private room. But listen, there's a lot of agents in there, but you're not getting arrested. And I go, okay. But I still don't believe them, right? So one of them's in front of me, one's in back. And we, I walk in, I turn this corner, and I walk into this, to this, uh, dining room it's a private dining room and there's eight FBI agents and eight there's two behind me one in front of me one behind me so there's eight there's ten now and I go uh, freaked out the guy goes one of the guys the senior agent stands stands up and goes relax 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 you're not getting arrested and I'm like okay and uh they're like sit down and they said so look man we've been we watch you all the time we know what you do and they're like you know that we're gonna you're either gonna get life in prison or you're gonna get killed and I go, yeah, probably. So that's pretty much how I felt at that point in my life. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it's just that's you inevitable. Moving, you were moving and shaking that fast yeah. and that quickly that they, you got on their radar like that? That they're talking about life? No, uh, no, no, I had been arrested by them many, many times. Yeah, but I'm many, just many now times. I'm about with the Columbos, yeah. but now they, they collected you, I guess. Yeah, but then, so then they, they asked me, they said, um, <coughs> they told me, um, you know, you're going to get life in prison, you're going to get killed. And I said, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and then they told me that, um, you know, we want, we want you to do some stuff first. And I'm like, no, I'm not interested. I don't want to rat on my friends. I'm not interested in doing that. And then they said, well, hear us out. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want to do this. <clears throat> and the guy's like, just sit down and listen. So I did. And he goes, look, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be eventually you're going to go to, you're going to be dead or you're going to be in prison. That's the end of your life. Or we could offer you one other thing. And I said, what? And they said, we could offer you a second chance. Okay. 
No, I had wanted to quit a long time and wanted to do something else. And I had tried, but you know how it is. It's like, dude, you're not, you're not really going to do it because the money's too easy. And uh, they said, I'll give you, we'll give you a second chance, just like you start all over. And they go, tell me about it. And they're like, look, we just want you to, to, to get, gather intelligence for us. And I'm like, uh, you know what? I don't want to wear a wire on the LA guys, my friends. I, I'm not, I don't want to do it. And they're like, we don't even care. We just want intelligence. We want all the places you go. Cause I go to, I go to Cleveland, I go to Rhode Island, I go to Pittsburgh, you know what I mean? Like I'm all over, Jersey, New York, Bronx, you know, I know guys down there and uh, they, want, they, they just want intelligence. And I'm like, well, how long do I have to do this? And they're like six months a year top. And I go, they go, you want, do you want to think about it? And I go, so I get a, a fresh start. And they're like, yeah, like zero. And I go, I'll do it. Because at, at that point, I was... 28 years old, I've been involved like just about 20 years, just almost like, I think about 30, I was about 30, I think, and I was about just about 20 years of, of being a criminal. You know, since I've been in juvenile hall and been arrested out since I was 13. So it's, it's a long time. And, and uh, I was over it. I, 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 there's no period, the longest I'd ever been off probation, parole, incarcerated, or yeah, pretrial services, you know, on bond was three months out of that time period, my whole life. And so I was just pretty much over it, but so it sounds intriguing. So I said, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. I made that decision right there. I, I, th I felt like that's a decision that either going to do it or you're not. And I decided I'm going to do it. And then I started, I just started giving them intel about different clubs and stuff that they want to know different places, you know, and like who's in charge. And, and like when I could say, when I, where I used to go places like Pittsburgh or Cleveland, I touched base with the locals. And then I'd find out, like, you know what I mean? Like, what's going on? Who's boss? And meet people, hang out with them. And that's what I did. And I started giving them intel. And then later on in New York, they, uh, what they, uh, the Columbus squad met with me and they wanted to know about um, this guy, Uncle Manny Garofolo and Eddie Garofolo and uh, a, a telephone business that used to be Wild Bill's and uh, George Trapiano's and, and, you know, all those people were involved in it. And so I was part of that business and they wanted to know about that. So then I started wearing a wire and then see, remember, Teddy's not supposed to get out. Teddy wasn't supposed to be part of this whole thing. The Rockefeller. And then, yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, Teddy got out and then things got crazy. Well, he's so. just, he's just a wild guy, Teddy. I mean, we know that. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. But so. I mean, I'm in New York now and he's been home for a little while now and I, I really haven't heard much. Him and Joe Waverly, they're both home. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's boss. He owns like an auto shop. You know what I mean? Whatever he's doing, he's doing. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Good luck. But he, like this, to be honest with you, Teddy wasn't, he's crazy. I mean, he's, he's a wild guy. He fits that profile. The, one, one of the things he told me, he's like, man, I got to leave some bodies in the street. I got to let people know I'm back. I mean, he, but, he, but out of the guys, he wasn't like a bad dude. Like he wasn't like evil. Like he wasn't like a real nasty guy he, a lot of people took advantage of him because he's gone for a long time they used his name to make a lot of money he nice. didn't make it yeah it, but it is what it is he made his choices in life i made my choices he made his choices. that 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 right there that fbi meeting with me was uh that was a fork in my life i could have gone either way see i could have told him to f off and kept on doing it and you wouldn't be talking to me because i'd be in prison or dead nice. that's it now so. let me ask you a question were you there during the colombo wars no. So nope. this was this was after the Colombo was. Correct. Okay, because you said you were involved in the business with Wild Bill. No, no, I was in his business, Wild Bill. They took it over afterwards. He, afterwards. he started this. And they kept it yeah. going after he was gone. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, I was up there all the time with other guys. You know, it, like George Trapiano was there, and uh, yeah. other other guys were a part of it then at that point. So now. Were you studying your art at the same time? No, I always had studied uh, martial arts. Uh, I wrestled, and when I was a kid, I, I always took martial arts. I used to take Jeet Kune Do, JKD, which is Bruce Lee's fighting method. I was a kickboxer and boxer, but that I pretty much done forever. And um, I didn't until it was like when I was when I was in still involved. I I would always box and everything. And then one time I had gotten in a fight with somebody and this is like real early 
we were in a parking lot actually. This is pretty disgraceful. And I was like pounding him, and then he's like grabbing my arm, grabbing my arm, and I couldn't even even throw my arm, so I kept punching him. But I wrestled it up. I just dropped him on his head, and then uh, someone's like, "Man, he he like that guy. That guy knows some racy stuff. That's what he was doing to you." And I'm like, "Oh, whatever." And I was like, it, but I was like weird. I remember he's like stuck on my arm and I'm like, man, I can't get rid of this guy. But then like a, a, a couple of times later, I went to this underground fight and these Gracie guys were there and I went and I, I, I learned about them and then I started training with them. And then I went to a couple other places and I started training jujitsu. I went to this place called Joker's Wild Fighting Academy, which is in, in, in Orange County was, was pretty famous. A lot of pro fighters went there and I started training with them and I started taking jujitsu really seriously. And I started doing two a days and I trained with high level guys because they come in for the fighters. And so I'd always like a lot of people when they want to learn martial arts or they want to learn boxing or they don't want to go with the, the best guys. Dude, that's the best time. Who cares if they could snuff you? You learn from the best guys. So I started going with the best people I could go. And then after, after I got out of the, out everything and I had to go in, in, in you know, Witsec to disappear, I lived someplace in Idaho and I had, there was nothing to do. I, I didn't have a job. I just have to sit around. What am I gonna do? Watch TV and I re, watch TV, read books. So I, I found a place and I would go and the guy told me it was like a hundred dollars unlimited classes. So I had no job, I had no, I have no ID. So I used to just go there and like, just take all the classes. But then like after a while, he's like, oh man, I know you've done this before. <laughs> so maybe it, would you like to teach some of the uh, classes? And, I'll, and I'm like, well, I really wanted to, but I didn't have an ID. So I thought he was going to ask me, you know what I mean? Like, like for something. Yeah, like and so, security number, I need something to put yeah. on the record just in case somebody gets yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. But then he, then he goes, but man, he goes, I'll just pay you cash for the table. And I'm like, boom, I'm your guy. That's and so man, he wanted you. Yeah. And so I started, I started like training all the time. And that training diverted my mind from like dude i had been a constant criminal for like all 20 years you know my whole life and so it got me away from that 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 thought that thought process of short term like jujitsu is great because it gives you long-term thinking like you got to plan ahead it's not just muscle it's like you got to think about six eight ten moves ahead of time Z do this do that and it's like and it takes a long time you don't just master it because it doesn't matter how good i am I'm good against you. I meet the next guy who has a different body type and he's better. So you got to be able to flow. So it taught me that and it ingrained it in my head. Even when I'm teaching other people, I'm still learning, you know? And so after I was in, done that for 18 months, I just started training like all the time. Like I started working. I got a, like, I, I had my first legitimate job since I was like 14 years old, you know? And I used to show up early at this job all the time. They're like, dude, you're never late. Because I'm used to being on time, you know. Like I just have a good work ethic, and then as soon as it was, as soon as it was over, I'd go and I'd go right to the gym and I'd do jujitsu, and then and and do MMA, do striking, and then pretty soon the the guy who owned the MMA place asked me it after I was out of program. He asked me if uh, I wanted to have a key, if I if I would get a key and open up, to make sure the classes were all started on time. And I'm like, okay. So I was like, dude, this guy trusts me with a key to his gym. You know what I mean? Like coming as being a criminal, he knew my background. This and so he trusted me. This is the guy's life, livelihood. Yeah, right. Him. And so he he trusted me with that. I took it so, and I, I trained all the time and I trained. That's why I started training pro fighters. I, I started being in their fight camp and, and someone offered, like one time I trained someone and they go, hey man, here, here's some money. And I'm like, what? And he, pay, he paid me money for training. And right then, now I had I had legitimate jobs, but I was like, man, this is great. I get to help people and I could train, you know, I mean, train. So I started training for free. And then um, one of the guys who trained there was a guy named Mark Munoz. He became big in the UFC. He wasn't in the UFC yet. He was going to be. And he, he came to me and he said, he's going to open up his own gym. And would I like to come there and work with him? And uh, I said, and I said, yeah. And so him and I, I went with them and I was there from the very first day and I started working with them and I trained with all the, all the, the biggest fighters in the UFC, every guy there, Jake Ellenberger, Pat, Pat Cummings, Mark Munoz, uh, King Mo. He was I mean, a big name in UFC. Yeah. And so me and I trained with Mark and Mark, Mark and his wife, Mark's a big Christian. Okay. Big Christian. And he knew about my past and he, still. So after practice, 
well, before we had fights and everything, he would always pray like, hey, let's all get together, let's pray. And I really didn't, I, I wasn't like about that. I didn't really, I was like, oh man, it's just not for me. And um, I just like, he just kept doing it. And I just kept showing up and like the positive people around me. And uh, it just, it, it, that whole thing, that whole journey like changed my life. And so I started training people there. I was in like Fabricio Verdum's camp with Mark, all these people. I just, I helped out a lot of people there. And I started getting paid to train pro fighters. And uh, like little by little, like I just started seeing like how good like Mark and everyone else was doing, you know? And so then I, and slowly, like cause they never tried to push religion on me. I just, like one day I just decided like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to be like a Christian. And I was, dude, I was so scared to go to, to go to church. And uh, I went with my wife, my wife, I, I, I was scared. Like, I, like, dude, my yeah, knees I were shaking. Before. I feel like, yeah. like uncomfortable, you know. No, no dude, I, like, hey, my, my heart was beating. My knees were shaking. Like, put it this way. I went with Teddy and those guys to do a shootout in, in Bay Ridge against Craig Marino. I was with him. I recorded it for the FBI. I was, my heart wasn't even beating then, and my heart wasn't, and my knees were like, but I went to church. I think like, everyone's going to know I'm a fraud. I can't believe I'm here. And when I went in there, I just got like instant relief. And then I knew that what direction I was heading was the right way. And I couldn't, I, I, I never, I already promised the FBI, I promised myself that I would never go back to anything illegal. I made, I made a promise to myself that I would never do it. And I, and I kept that promise. But right then, I already knew that my life was never going to be the same. And I wasn't going to be like I used to be. Like, like at first, when I first got out, like I was like, you know, I was, I was working. I'm a, I had a, a great business. I was in the mortgage business. I had making a lot of money. So it's basically like I'm a gangster, just not doing the crime. So like that same attitude. You know what I mean? Like, look at my car, like the same stuff. And then by that time, like through jujitsu and through, and through this, my whole life changed. My outlook on life changed. Like I didn't need all that stuff. And it, it just, it, it changed me. And then like working hard with everyone, working towards a goal, putting in the long hours, feeling defeat, falling down, getting up, and just constantly getting better and better and better. It taught me a whole bunch. And so that's when my life really changed. And that was about, about eight years ago when I did that. And uh, from then on, I just like, like I, I worked for Mark for like three and a half years. And then I started working up in LA at a, a boxing gym called Fortune Gym. And the guy there is a, a master trainer, trains the Manny Pacquiao, like world champion boxers. I started working with uh, other MMA guys and boxers and world champion boxers. I started training them in conditioning, which is what I'm good at. And uh, got them ready for fights. I got the world heavyweight champion ready for his fight. I got a lot of guys ready. And I just learned, I started helping people. I like, I started getting, I get the younger guys would come to me and they knew about my past and so they'd ask me and I'd be like, dude, there's no winners in that game. What, you know, what you're doing, you think you're going to get ahead. There's no happy endings to the story. Like out of all the things that all the people I know, and, and you, you could attest to this, out of all the people we know, no matter what, there's no happy ending. It doesn't matter if you're the boss or not. There's no happy. Like you're going to go to prison. Your family's going to be in turmoil. Because you don't just destroy yourself. You destroy everyone in your family. Well, that's so, the, if, you, if you got a heart like you're talking about. <sighs> That's yeah. what hurts us the most. It, we're destroying everybody around us. Forget about it. Correct. We don't care about ourselves. Right. Yeah. We're destroying everybody around us. And that's where we become domestic terrorists. Right. And, and, and people, like, people argue with me all the time. No, no, no. Like Carlo Gambino. No, no, dude. His sons. Look what happened to his sons. Look what he did. Look what he did to his family. Look at his cousins. Look at everyone. He destroyed lots of people's lives. Oh, no. Anthony Arcardo from Chicago. Yeah, look at him. In a small cemetery. Yeah. I mean, right. How many, people, how many deaths did Anthony Ocado order? How many deaths did he do? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Listen, there's but no they, but, romance. There, there's a romance that people think with the life. Yeah. Involved in it when they don't realize it's treachery, not romance. Yep. Yeah. It's masked by romance. Yeah. Looks, the sharpness. Listen, I was telling people for a while, I never considered myself a gangster. I was a street guy. I, like you said, I've been wanting, I wanted to be a street guy since I was old enough to think. Since I was old enough to remember, I wanted to be a street guy. I still consider myself a street guy just without committing the crimes. I just said I just stopped committing the well, crimes. Yeah, I'm a street guy. It's still in me, yeah. right? 
I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not like that anymore. I'm not, I don't have the hard part. I'm sure you're not going to pull something over on me. No. Like, you know, but that's right. When I talk to all these young guys, I talk to young fighters, young guys that want to do something. I'm like, bro, you got to, everyone wants to be a chief. No one wants to be an Indian. You got to earn it. You got to be there. You got to put in the time. You know, you want to be good at jiu you got to show up. You want to be good at boxing, you got to, you got to train. And that's how I got out. Free. I learned how yeah. to be Indian and not a chief. I had to humble myself so big Correct. that I went to work for under minimum wage. But yeah, years, of course. That I had to walk to work where right. Baba was three houses down from my house and I would drive a brand new Range Rover three houses away from my house to get a haircut every three days. Now I'm walking yeah. four miles to work in the snow making right. minimum weight like that's how bad i had to come down and humble myself into being an indian not a chief anymore just exactly what you said that's how i knew this was going to be a great conversation because there's no line in you and everything that you're saying is 100 percent true just like what you just said people probably missed that part you went with teddy now i didn't know you were there to have a shootout against greg marino now greg and teddy were on the same side during the war but teddy's always hated greg for some yep. reason They've hated each other. I don't know if they hated each other. I know that Teddy always hated Greg. And I think Greg's home now or is coming home. And they're on the same side. They fought the same side during the war. They just... They're home. Bruce. He's home. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know what I mean? Just by you saying that and the things that you're saying, this is all true, you know? And you're, you're coming from an upper-middle-class family, not a lower-middle. You're an upper-middle... I would even say upper-class coming from Orange County. Majority upper class now mother and father both legitimate working people or mother was a housewife and father went to work no like my, my, of- mom, my, my mom my mom worked in investment counseling she's a, uh, a college degree my dad had a college degree he worked for tv guide he's an artist uh my mom uh you know handled big accounts large accounts for investment firms and you just you know, from day one wanted to be a gangster a kid come, like I, I i can understand a lot of things you want to smuggle drugs through your surfboard from Hawaii yeah. to Orange yeah. County. But like, yeah. to become a gangster is like a big yeah. scheme. I can't, I can't yeah. think of a guy like me growing up in Orange County. I was, I, I was a big athlete when I was younger. I don't think I probably would have had the thought process of being a gangster. It's very hard to swallow that, that that was your thought process since you were young. Yeah, I just, I just enjoyed it. And like, because of my martial arts, because I knew how to fight, yeah. Even though I'm smaller, I just like ah, knock you got knock him out. That I got a problem. That's it. Because like the, my, what happened is I learned from really good people, like really good martial artists. Like the guy who taught me, Ted Luke Luke is like a legend. He died of a heart attack. Like after I turned 18, he died. I kind of when I, I probably would have got off bad anyway, but then I had no because all the people, you know what they they encourage you to be bad. Yeah. You know, you, you get that, you get that praise, man. It makes you feel good. Yeah. And when you're young, when you're young, you don't like, dude, okay. I'm not even going to go so far as to say, I didn't know any better. I knew better, but it feels good. And so that's why I did it. But oh, it wasn't know, smart. We all know better. I'm tired. I'm tired. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. We all know better. It's, we, we all know better. better. We don't want to. We Correct. want to make that choice. We want to make, listen, maybe some of us in the beginning, like me, it really was one of the only choices I had. I had other choices. They were just worse. But then yeah. there came a time where I could have made that turn because I knew better and I was able to get out and I didn't want to. I mean, didn't want Correct. to. Was it. And you, you yourself, I mean, you went from the top guys in LA to the top guys in New York. You know what I mean? And you weren't even Italian and they accepted right. you in their inner circle. Like they were telling you, right. I'm going to introduce you to the future bosses. I'm going to introduce you to high ranking captains. Like you, like there was not even a question. Like they just knew you were a stand up guy. And look, I mean, you talk about it. Like I talk about going to get a burger or a normal person. Yeah. We were going to go do a shooting one day. Me and Teddy were going to go clip Greg Marino. And I was more scared about going to church than going to do this hit. That's a, you know, that's usually like a question I ask people about public speaking, you know? Uh, yeah. I Mazarin and I asked my sister, was it, you know, was it more like, were you more nervous public speaking or were you more nervous on pulling the trigger? You know, he picked public speaking. You picked going to church. Correct. <laughs> so I, I feel like, I feel like everyone would find out like I'm a fraud. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. you know, I'm like so bad. Maybe I'd, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, uh, but listen, so. even the stuff like you said, people, I still call him Don Carlo. So I'm one of them guys. Like, but you're right. Yeah. 
Look at his sons. I've met his sons. I've met his nephews. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah, all right, they're they're rich, but they've done a ton of jail time. They been on the run. They've been shot. They've been stabbed. I mean, yeah, you could probably go see a few of them still on 18th Avenue. But just like you said, like you know, yeah, where where is the romance and the glory for what you're building? Your le- like my legacy, your legacy is yeah. for your children not. To have taking that money and that legacy you've built and done something positive with it. That's what you want. Correct. But with these old time Sicilians, they want their families going back to the old days in Sicily to carry that on. You know what I mean? It's it's yep. like because it started out as an honor of men, men of honor, you know, an honor society for men. You know, we're talking about the 1800s to 1700s when it all started. And your story is absolutely amazing. I mean, are you, did you write a book? Are you writing a book? Because yeah, no, no. I wrote, I wrote a, I wrote a book called break shot, a life in the 21st century American mafia. Okay. I said, well, yeah, everybody, my book that's coming out, is going to be about, you know, the 21st century Cosa Nostra and a friend of mine whose book is finished. He's just waiting for it to come out. Did a modern day Cosa Nostra book as well. Uh, Would say the name again for my supporters so they can hear it. It's, it's called break shot. Break, break shot. A, break shot. A, a break shot. Yeah, break shot. A life in the 21st century American mafia. Okay. So that was my that was the code name the FBI gave me, break shot. So that's what they knew me by. Right. So you just decided to just up. I mean, these guys weren't your childhood friends. So and, correct. I mean, as you've seen, two guys who were fighting on the same side of the war were going to get each other to kill each other. Well, also, let's be honest. After I went with Teddy to do that. Do you honestly think me not being a person, me not being Italian, me not being one of his brothers would have been around much longer? Let's be honest. No. And he, Come on. No. One little, once you stop earning for them, correct. One little mistake, clip Kenji. That's right. Right? So, I mean, yeah. there was a little whisper that I always talk about this because yep. uh, when I was younger, I looked up to the man, Joey Scopo Sr. Yep. Was told, somebody whispered, kill Joey Scopo and the war's over. And we both know who that person was. Correct. And just like that, it doesn't matter. One yep. little thing, just like you just said, not being Italian, not earning, you're watching one Italian go kill another Italian who actually helped each other win the war. So you're seeing it firsthand and you're saying, you know what? This was probably the first right decision I did make. You yep. know what I mean? It, the, the more I was in, the more I was around him in Brooklyn, the more I was I was over it, and the more I can see that that it was a total waste of my life. And uh, towards the end, I I didn't even want to be around him anymore. Like I ended up wearing a wire for like eight years. It was a long time. I didn't want to do it. And oh, you, uh, oh so you did wind up wearing a wire? Yeah, I did. Like I, I recorded that that hit. Teddy went to prison for it. He got like twelve years for it. Um, I didn't want to attempt to. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing with Craig. I didn't want to do this anymore i didn't want to do it i was over i didn't want to be around those people but even after i got out like it's hard like you it, it's hard to get like it's like i just sat there by myself in idaho and i used to think about it like that was my identity that was my life and it was it's really hard like that's why i understand it's hard for guys to get out but if you want to change then you got to leave that life you got to not just burn that bridge you got to blow that bridge up you got to never go back it's, it's people, never an option I, I want this message to get out to my supporters so bad you know um because i remember i was away with frankie blue eyes i anytime i talked to a colombo guy because i had a i i this guy was just a total nut job you know what i'm talking about right from the colombo yeah, yeah and yep. he told me about you he says uh teddy's got a big earner around though japanese guy named kenji didn't know you didn't mention your last name because you have an italian last name so when i did hear your last name i'm like well any relation to crazy joe and larry and them and I said, no, 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 he's from L.A. But uh, he said he has this guy around him, good earner. Uh, uh, actually said Asian. He didn't necessarily yeah. know your background. And uh, I was like, oh, good for him, you know, whatever, you know. And my question to you, would you disappear on me? Hello? Yeah, you there? yeah right? Yeah, yeah. And some a call came in on my phone. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. now, there's no loyal, it's all treachery at the end. I mean, I went right. through life with guys that I was friends with before we decided to go into the life. So we kind of thought we wouldn't do that to each other, you know? But 
being because now at one time when Kozinosha was going at full force, it was 25 families throughout the country. Correct. Right. Now, how was the other families compared? I know Cleveland was very loyal. I know yeah. California, uh, LA was very loyal. How what was the difference between the New York crime families, so like LA, Cleveland, Rhode Island, the other families you've dealt with? Like, there, there, it was like, that day, New York was like the Sharks, man. But even, even in California, because they had a lot of guys that, in LA County that were from, from New York, New Jersey, from Cherry Hill, like that kind of thing. But it, 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 is even really, it is even really the crews so much. It's the talent pool, the family. Like, look, America's changed. You don't want to have loyalty. Like I said, everyone wants to be an Indian. I mean, to be a chief. No one wants to be an Indian. They don't want to work towards anything. They're all, they all think short-term. The old-timers used to think long-term. These guys don't have any honor. They're like, oh, the scumbag went to jail. Cool, we'll steal everything. We're not going to help him out. And fuck his that's, wife. Let's fuck his yeah. wife. Let's rob yeah. his right. Yeah, let's rob yeah. Let's all, everything he's got his street. You know, if he's got a brother, we'll rob him. I mean, and this that's the problem. It's not just New York. It's not just Costa Nostra, it's all the crimes. It's, it's like the talent pool has gone down. And I hate to say it like that, but it has. It's like, yeah. it's like they're, just, they're just not good. No one has any morals anymore. And you could see that in, in, in everyday life. It's like- I call it street ethics now. Nobody, yeah. No longer has street ethics. Yeah, none. Now, you know, now that we've learned that we have work ethic, because yeah. we're able to, because we've never worked before, but now that we are yeah. every day, yeah. I call it now, these guys no longer have street ethics. There is no street right. ethics anymore. Right. But when right. you were moving around, yeah. you're saying New York was the most treacherous out of all the crime families that you've done? Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Because yeah. they do a lot of killing. Like yeah. in Canada, in LA, Rhode Island. Yeah. These guys get into yeah. a problem, they find a guy in the river. You know what I mean? Right, but they weren't, they weren't all like trying to, like they had a structure... They weren't right. all trying to like kill their brothers, rip off their cousin. Right. You know what I mean? It, right. it, it just wasn't like that. It had their father clipped inside a Burger King drive-thru. Right, the drive-thru, yeah. They cut him in for enough of his Joker Poker money. Are you Correct. Kidding? I'm actually yeah. going to do an episode on Joker Poker real soon. I'm doing a whole series of uh, stories mm -hmm. so people can see how it all leads to it. Besides my interviews, I put out a story every week. And I'm going to do one on that. People don't believe how much money was in Joker money. Poker's yeah. And these two kids, and the father just gave them like five million each or something. Wow! They, they wanted it all. They go and clip their own father over a joke of poker, which you know anyway. If the father's a made guy, or if the father is a, which they call a golden goose to a made guy, and you clip them, you're not going to do that business. Right? They're taking that business away from you. I've watched, of course they're going to take it. Yeah, I've watched this be done so many times. So I mean, just like that alone, like you know. It, it's just insane. Now, moving on to the now the Francis family. Did you do right. you have dealings with them since California and also being involved with the Columbos? No, I like I knew um, John, his brother. Uh, I knew like the somebody I knew was close to the dad, but I was close to the people that used to be in his crew. So that's how I that's how I came in with them, and they're, they're they're you know they're good. But like in California, there's other guys too. Like at, that, at the point, like there was like Joey Ippolito. Um, Joey Ippolito. Yeah, Ippolito. There was uh, there's some there's some Cherry Hill guys that are in the LA family. Uh, there's 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 there was other there's other real real guys, you know. Well, talking about Cherry Hill guys, Carlos' kids are Cherry Hill guys. Well, yeah. they were Carlos' kids. They're they're nephews. They're the, they're nephews. They're related to the guy. Pete, that's at like Henry and Union Street in Brooklyn. You know yeah. those guys, yeah, those guys down there. So oh, yeah, I just looked at an apartment on Henry Street. It's that's so funny, funny. They said that they cleaned yeah. it up down there. I actually went to look. The price is up. It's you get a cheap apartment in Manhattan. Wow. Yeah, they cleaned yeah. it up so good down there on Henry Street. It was exactly on Henry Street. So funny he said that. Yeah. So that because that's that also used to be where like Reno had his uh, truck yes. the. The truck business right down there by the electronic place. Actually, yeah. about three blocks away from there. Okay. Yeah. So those guys down there in that in that cafeteria, that place, that Italian place, they they're they're relatives of the guys in LA, and so there's a lot of those guys down there. So now, did you have to plead at any? And now you said you were juvenile delinquent, meaning you were always. Yeah. Okay. Now, as an adult, 
when the feds came to you, did they wipe that clean or did you come out with felonies? No, I mean, I, I changed my name, everything. You know, I, I, I had pled, I had pled guilty. To, I had done time and, done, and pled guilty to all my cases. Everything was adjudicated. That's what a lot of people were like, oh no, you, you, you flipped because you got, uh, they, they got you to, dude, I pled guilty on my last case six years before I finished even wear to wire. Because yeah. you know why? I was over it. I didn't even care. I just couldn't be in that life anymore, honestly. And I, I played guilty on that already before that. So I had to, I, I had to go and, and check in with parole just like everyone else. You know? You, said you I, decided to change your life on your own. That it wasn't defensive. You were getting up to walk no, out. Decided right, to but, yeah, but they gave me a chance, man, that, that, that no one else could give me. There's no one in the life that could give me that chance. A fresh start. Nobody in the world that could give you that chance. Right. And so I, I took it, man. I, like, I ran with it. That's the most valuable thing that ever happened for me. So if you get fingerprinted, would, will your old felonies come up? It'll go to the FBI. I'm sure they'll probably, maybe, maybe they will. I don't know. Maybe, right. maybe not. I, I want to show people that even though they have felonies, they can get back out in the world and do what I'm doing and do what you're oh, doing and so, get so, off and so like this, like, this, uh, uh, like this first is, of all, the whole message at the end of this show is showing them where the positivity comes from leaving. Okay, so here's the thing with me. First thing I do is when, I, when I'm like going for like work, I let people know about my past. That way, there's like no surprises. You know what I mean? Like none. This is me. This is what I am. I'm no longer like that. Get to know me with my character. Like you said, you had to start below minimum wage like that. You have to. Because no one wants to give you a chance. But once one person does, other people take notice. People see that you just show up all the time, on time. Don't do, you do the work. Nothing gets stolen. There's no problem. Boom, boom, boom. It needs to be done. No problem. I offer to do it. Other people aren't willing to do that. Even regular people. People have a college education. They don't want to start at the bottom. But it, once people see you do that, you could start over, man. You know? I, 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 have, I have felons now that work with me that have changed their lives, man. Like, was in prison for uh, six years, got out, works two jobs. He works a, a legit job. He moved from a warehouse. Now he's a salesman. He, big company, makes a great buddy. Uh, just sold a second house. He's building a, building a third house. He had, and, and at nighttime, he works delivering Uber Eats to pay, pay for that house. He's got two kids now. That's what you got to do if you want to change your life. And like this, we're we're behind the clock, we're behind the eight ball now. So that means we got to work twice as hard to play catch up. My felonies must have been so bad. I applied for all of that stuff when I came home. The Uber Eats, Uber, um, it's, they denied me for my record. I had no, I didn't get a name. I didn't get a new name. I didn't get a new record. I just changed my life. I decided to just walk away from life. So all my felonies were there. That's why I had to start at a job that wouldn't pay $750 for a background check. And I started under minimum wage and I had to start at the bottom and humble myself. And now going forward, like my name is who do you, I mean, it's, I can't just tell people, if people ask me, I'll tell them my story. If they don't, I'm not gonna volunteer it. Cause once I always got to introduce myself as Anthony Russo. Once I introduce myself as Hootie, it may be a day, it may be a week, it may be a month that person's going to run into a person and be like, yo, that dude used to run with these guys. Yo, that dude used to do this. Yo. So it's very hard for me, especially in New York. My name yeah. is known with so many people and so many different crews that it eventually hits legitimate people. It's so hard. Like a union won't, like I went to a legitimate guy and he knew I changed my life. And he was like, listen, he goes, I trust you. I, I want to hire you. I know your work ethic. I know your show up. Because I just can't have this stigma of Hootie being here. It's just people be talking about it. You know, it'll disrupt work. It'll disrupt this. Then other people will know you were here. So it's not that easy for me like it is for other people. And I try to show people as hard as it is for me, I'm still up every day at five in the morning. And I'm out there on the grind. No matter what I'm making, I'm keeping the lights on. I'm keeping the roof over my head. Like I said, I humbled myself. People don't even believe me. They're like, Come home from jail and I'm talking to people. I still talk to people in the life, May guys, other crews. And they're like, you're going to work every day? I said, no bullshit. No, no. I haven't thought about crime since I came home in 2015. Not a single day goes by. I says, I will work breaking my ass for minimum wage to keep the lights on because I am so against that life now. 
And I'm glad I get to talk to people like you who could also show it on the positive message because a lot of people just sit around and say, there's no way Hootie's doing that because there's no way a guy like him could do that because people knew me in the streets. They knew how I lived. They knew how I wanted to live. They knew the things that I wanted. And what I'm doing now doesn't fit how my personality was for 38 years. That's what I did for 38 years. And I'm so thankful for you to come on and give and show them besides me showing them and talking to them another perspective of changing your life where I, I made the decision to walk away from the life. You had a choice, change my life for the better or go back and end up in jail or dead. And you made the right decision. You made a self consciousness like you, you, it was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a better person for it. And I commend you for that. And I, and I thank you for coming on here and telling your story and show these people where they can get your book. And, oh, I'm going out. The person that we were talking with, the end of July, yeah. spend two weeks with them and train. I'm going to be training okay. for two weeks. The end of July. Yeah, no, here, here. And he's going It'll to be good. Me a little bit. He's going to get me back into shape a little bit. So for two weeks, I'm going to go out there. We're going to, we're going to roll around on the mat for a while. Good. So yeah. here, here's, here's what I want to say to everyone. It's tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to fall down. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. It's going to get, you have to be uncomfortable. You want to go into change. You're going to, you're going to have to be uncomfortable in life. You're going to have to start at the bottom. But I got to tell you something. It does get better. It does get better. It's not whatever, wherever you are today, right now is not where you're always going to be like this. As humans, we always think this is it, man. I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here digging holes. People see you put in the work effort. They're going to move you up. Life gets better. It, it's constantly getting better. And you hit rough patches. So does everyone in life. But we can do it. We can all change. I appreciate that, Kenji. I appreciate you yeah. coming on. And you're 100% right. Four years at working at the same prey before now I'm just starting to see the light. It would have broke. Right. It would have broke, it would have broke a lesson. It would have broke a better man. It would have broke a lesson. Man. And you know, in the, and you know in that line, Legitimate guys are worse than criminals and street guys. Correct. They tell on you faster. Correct. They're the biggest yep. crybabies. They'll stab you Correct. in the back faster. Correct. I've learned that the nine Me to five too. guy is a worse criminal than the real the guys that they call criminals. Correct. You guys are committing crimes on a daily basis that criminals don't commit. Correct. The they, 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 get, they get away with it. Yeah. yeah. And you not at work being legitimate guys, and I see this, and it's like, wow. This is some shit. Like I had to worry about treachery when I was in the life. I got to worry about it in the legitimate world. It took me four years now just to start to see the light a little bit better now to move on to something better. But it's worth it, just like you yeah. said. And Kenji, thank you yeah. for coming on. And listen, no good problem. luck to you and you know, good good training you. and everything. And I wish you nothing but the best. And thank you for joining me again, guys. And uh, we're going to have another great episode of me uh, telling American and you know what? We're going to go far in as well, causing OSHA stories. Tune in. Stay up. Yeah.